Hello, everyone. My name is Catherine Grady, and I'm the Dean of Brandeis International Business School and the Fred and Rita Richmond Distinguished Professor in Economics. Thank you all for joining us for day two of our inaugural Trends in Asset Management Conference. I'd also like to thank our conference sponsors, the International Business School's Asset Management and Council, Council and the Rosenberg Institute of Global Finance. Today's programming is focused on private equity markets, and our first session of the day will explore the evolving private equity landscape, particularly as it relates to valuations and market dynamics. Our moderator for this session is Deborah Schufrin. A graduate of Brandeis University, Deborah is the Chief Investment Officer at Colby College. She previously served as Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Brandeis University and is a member of our Asset Management Council. Joining Deborah are panelists Andrea Auerbach, Hugh MacArthur, and another Brandeis alum and former university trustee, Bruce Pollock. Andrea is a partner and the head of Global Private Investments at Cambridge Associates. Hugh is a partner and head of the Global Private Equity Practice at Bain & Company, and Bruce is managing partner at Center Partners. Let's begin today's programming. Deborah, please take it away. Thanks, Dean Grady, and uh, welcome to our esteemed panelists. Um, uh, Dean Grady gave a very quick snapshot of just sort of what your titles are. I'm going to just give very quick uh, intros, but I know we have a lot of uh, uh, questions to get to, so um, I will I will make make these introductions quick, and we will jump right in. But um, I I would be remiss if I didn't once again say thank you to to all of you for joining us today. This is going to be a great conversation, and I've been really excited about it. So first, um, Andrea Auerbach, the Global Head of Private Investments at Cambridge Associates. Andrea leads a 50-person team that sources and underwrites private equity, growth equity, distressed, and venture capital funds. She's been at Cambridge Associates for more than 20 years and currently chairs the co-investment and secondaries investment committees. And she previously chaired the private investment committee. Hugh MacArthur is the head of Bain's global private equity practice. And Hugh helped found the practice 25 years ago and works with a variety of private equity funds and alternative asset managers on everything from asset class strategy, geography, fund operations, fundraising, strategic due diligence, and portfolio company improvement. Um, sounds like you got a lot on your plate, Hugh. Uh, he also oversees Bain's annual global private equity report, which tracks key metrics across the industry. And Hugh previously served as the chief investment officer for Bain and Company. And then finally, last but not least, our very own Bruce Pollock, who is the managing partner at Center Partners Management, a fellow Brandeis alum and the former chair of the investment committee of the Brandeis Endowment. Center Partners is a longstanding middle market private equity fund manager that focuses on consumer products and services as well as healthcare services. Bruce has been at Center Partners for more than 30 years and currently serves on the boards of 10 portfolio companies where he works closely with the management teams to help, help them formulate strategic financial and operational plans to drive growth and profit, profitability. Easy for me to say. Uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, let's jump in. So there's a lot to talk about. Um, I guess maybe a good place to start would be to talk about sort of the macro environment and the current state of the private equity market. Hugh, I might wanna start with you, um, given the work that you and your team have done on the global uh, private equity report that you put out annually, it would be great to kind of get your thoughts on um, what the current state of the private equity market looks like in terms of fundraising, dry powder, um, sort of all the key metrics that, that you guys are track, tracking and kind of what really stood out to you in this year's report. Thanks, Deborah, and hello, everyone. Well, what really stood out to me in, in this year's report is that we are seeing a supersizing of the private equity industry. And I mean that writ large, not just buyouts, although we can certainly talk about buyouts versus growth equity and other sub subsector asset classes. Um, this has been a trend that's been going on for about a decade, but we saw a huge acceleration in 2021, where for the first time ever, we crossed the trillion dollar mark in buyouts in terms of value of all deals done. The previous high was 06 and 07, around 800 billion. And I don't think anyone was forecasting we'd see a number like a trillion dollars uh, worth of deals done. That's literally twice the level of the previous year and twice the level of the average of the last four or five years. We also saw about a trillion dollars worth of exits in 2021. 
again, a record by a huge amount. And there really was a perfect storm last year of all of the exit channels, making them attractive. The equity markets were incredibly robust, uh, including SPACs as a new uh, potential exit for, uh, for many firms. The strategics taking advantage of the strong equity markets, strong GDP growth and cash flow were a tremendous exit channel. And sponsors uh, were flush with cash and had to invest it. And if they were businesses were doing well in a very stable GDP environment, it was time to sell and, and return money back to LPs. So uh, really ideal. Usually one of those channels is not functioning uh, on all cylinders. And so it, there's one that favored more than the other. But last year was really just uh, unbelievable across all those dimensions. And we saw writ large uh, for all private equity asset classes, over a trillion dollars uh, worth of, of funds raised. And now the dry powder stands at about three and a half trillion dollars for all private equity asset classes, which is again, a, a huge record. So we're seeing a secular flow of money into the private asset classes um, at the expense of uh, equity markets now and certainly credit markets, which have been weak uh, as investment areas for, for years. And we believe that that's a trend that's going to continue uh, over time. Great. Andrea, I'd love to kind of get, get your thoughts on, you know, uh, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's a secular change. You know, we certainly saw a big run up in private equity and valuations and fundraising kind of in the 2006, 2007 timeframe before the global financial crisis. Is this is this an echo of that? Is this is it is it secular? Is it cyclical? Is it some combination of two? And I guess what are the implications? <laughs> well, if you think about it, Deb, uh, the, the the institutional private equity market is basically a forty something, and I, I wish I was still forty something. Um, so <laughs> it's clearly still in growth mode compared to other forms of institutional market investing, right? So we've been on a long-term growth trajectory for decades, and there've been fits and starts to this. Like you can see the suspension bridge of commitments kind of peaking and fading and peaking again. And we've been in a, in a upward climb on the roller coaster ride in terms of commitments to the asset class. A lot of what's driving that is the long-term returns of the, of the industry. If you can withstand the illiquidity, and we can get into this later, I think more, we, have, we can withstand more illiquidity than we think, if I might just drop that on the table, um, then more and more capital is going to come for the private markets, right? And you know, one of the things that we like to track here at CA is, well, we like to track lots of things, um, naming the overhang way, way back in the day and kind of keeping track. And everything you said completely, of course, properly accurate. One of the metrics that we like to look at to figure out is this market ahead of itself, behind itself or peaking, is we actually look at the percentage of distributions relative to the net asset value of the industry. And if you think about this, private equity, everyone invests and they say, well, we're gonna invest over a period of time and then exit over a period of time. Right. And normally what we see in the global private equity space is that about 20% of the asset value is realized in any given year. That's still the case even in this market, right? And then if you pivot over to venture and venture might have a smaller percentage realized every year because the companies are younger, they take a little bit longer to build to something of value and to be exited. And what we've seen in the global uh, venture capital space is that the distribution yield in 2021 is running at around 20%, which is a little higher than the long-term average of 16%. But private equity is right on the money in terms of percentage realized. So the way we've been looking at this market is yes, it's scaling, but when you raise bigger funds, you invest more money and then more money should be coming back to LPs. So when GPs come in and trumpet, we've had the best year of distributions we've ever had. I'm like, yeah, according to my watch, you were supposed to. <laughs> so there's a little bit happening there. The secular trend is definitely continuing. I think one of the things we're really concerned about is the wall of capital keeps coming for this market. And how can an investor navigate through this market building exposures that will continue to deliver private equity alpha rather than beta. And, and that is a growing concern given, you know, we're looking at what, $30 billion mega funds today. We're heading for 50. It's just a matter of time, right? So lots of concerns looking forward to unpacking all of that. Bruce, this might be a good place for you to kind of chime in from a GP perspective. Is, is, is that what you're experiencing? What Andrea just described where yes, you're deploying capital maybe faster, but 
um, you're you're able to realize uh, you know the the value at the same pace that you've historically been able to realize, or is it taking longer to add value to these companies because you have to be a lot more hands on today? It's no longer just you know throw dollars in, flip it quickly, and and come yeah, look, the other I, side. I, I think that the time frames Andrew's talked about has been. Is, is been accurate for the last you know, really the last 10 years they're 12 you know we've been, we've been out of a recession for 13 years now so it's you know you know everybody's been able to see pretty strong demand for all types of uh, products and services you know over this period of times uh, and and in, in 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 conjunction also with low interest rates uh, you know and a really favorable operating environment you know you, you've you've continued seeing the opportunity to kind of do business as usual and 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 really it's it's been more kind of a um, dart, dart throwing that it has been been picking the best opportunities with with constraints but I think I think that all changes now and it's and I, you know I think with as interest with interest rates rising I think the, there was a, 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 a amazing amount of capital raised last year and this year because of the velocity of deals in the last two years uh, that velocity of transactions is going to decline over the next few years so you're going to see less deals deals of all this capital raised, Higher interest rates, you know, tougher economic environment, maybe a recession. So I think the next two years is really going to be different than the last thirteen. Um, and so, and and I think you know that then we can talk about that later. But that's that's going to have all sorts of implications for all this capital that's raised. It's not going to be able to find a home. But 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 to date, I think Andrew's been right on. We've been we've been pretty consistent in terms of you know getting getting you know eighty percent of our investments made and. And and exited within you know seven or eight years. I, I think that's right, and I just add to that that the you know if you look at the ten-year Treasury uh, yield curve over the last decade, it's been consistently down until recently, and that's allowed more and more cheap debt to be applied to deals, and that just makes multiples go up. And if you look at where returns have come from over the last decade, about fifty percent of the return is simply multiple appreciation. Uh, and that is the thing that Bruce is talking about that is now looks like it's going to stop uh, with the yield curve going in the other direction. Um, that easy multiple expansion is not going to be there. And over the last decade, I'd argue like if you weren't doing well as a GP, you're never going to do well because there, there are basically that was about as good an environment as you possibly could have for finding deals, doing deals and exiting in a very good environment. And we are moving into a period now that's quite different on a number of dimensions. Um, and you know, interest rates going up is going to be one problem. It's a problem for the current portfolio if you hadn't modeled in any multiple compression uh, in, 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 uh, in your exits. It's also a problem for what you're buying because now you can pay less. And of course, sellers don't want you to pay less. So there'll be a period of dislocation and, and, and mismatched expectations between buyers and sellers and doing deals. But the reason that interest rates is going up is inflation. And that's something that actually the industry has never really had to do with. No one doing deals in this industry has ever been dealing with an issue like we're dealing with now in inflation since we're talking about a 40 year, um, a 40 year high. And so thinking through how does that really impact businesses that I buy and what's in my portfolio um, and what do I do about it is something that the industry is really grappling with. And, and it's challenging. I talk to a lot of GPs who say, you know, I, I measure things very precisely and my margins are down across my portfolio by 300 basis points. And that's great, but how are you gonna get that back, right? And that, so what that means to me is that, you know, there are a lot of people that are grappling with uh, not just their cost out playbooks, which have been well-developed from the last recession, well-developed from the COVID pandemic in 2020 over time, but what's my price up playbook to try and maintain margin is a new question for a lot of GPs. And I think as they figure out how to answer that question, we may see an extension of holding periods of assets now over the next year or two because those margins have to come back and I need to be able to exit at a decent multiple. And so there's a lot of headwinds now that are starting to appear at the macro level, both in terms of deal making and what I already have in the portfolio that are going to make the next two years, as Bruce says, uh, an interesting run. And he would say um, it's, not, it's not just um, um, margin issues, it's availability of, of components and, and, and product. And so a lot of companies are starting to miss, you know, sales because they they, they don't have the the production capabilities um, to you know, because of supply chain issues to to, right. to, to fulfill their near the orders. I mean, I, honestly, I think uh, for all the GPs that were just picking, you know, B B quality companies and selling them at A prices, that's you know the tide's about to go out, right? 
But if you don't have actual operating capabilities to help your companies manage through whatever we're about to go through, and you weren't already doing that, figuring it out with a, in a falling knife environment is going to be very difficult for, for any GP. The other thing that I often reflect on is when you have rising rates um, and you have challenges with supply chain, everyone will continue to use technology to find a more efficient way to, to do whatever it is they need to do. And the fact that technology enterprise software is the single largest sector receiving private equity capital today, venture, it's always been the case, right? Technology, it's always overweight tech. But in the private equity realm, that is the number one space receiving capital today. And software is scalable, doesn't require a weight for components, and, and obviously is in a secular upward trend itself. As Mark Andreessen said, software is eating the world. That is 100% correct. Um, and we're watching that particular secular trend of tech going full horizontal, coming through the private equity space as well. And that growth and that recurring or reoccurring revenue may still, we expect will still continue to hold value. But we can talk about expansion stage uh, valuations later on in this conversation. <laughs> Well, no, that's a, that is a good segue to, to talk about returns. And I definitely want to return to the theme of technology and the role that that plays. But just given some of the comments that each of you have made around um, uh, margins and pressure, um, multiple, the, the role that multiple uh, appreciation has played. I mean, we, we've done some deep dives into some of the mega funds and tried to dissect where the returns have come from over the last uh, several years. And you know that fifty percent number of uh, of where uh, of multiple expansion uh, creating that much value, we actually got to higher numbers than that. So that that even seems low to me. Um, so with 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 that as sort of the the backdrop, are people's returns return expectations for private equity realistic? I mean, one of the most shocking statistics I found Hugh from the Bain Private Equity Report this year was that I think something like seventy five percent of the respondents sort of felt like. Um, they expected returns to be the same or better kind of go, going forward as they're committing capital. Do people have the right expected return rates or do people have to adjust their expected returns? You know, it's actually a tough question, Deborah. It's really easy to say expect lower returns when you look at kind of the macro environment we've been talking about. Um, and that may well be true. The overall returns in the industry have been declining if you take kind of a 20 year view although the top quartile returns still dramatically outperform any type of public benchmark, and they persistently outperform uh, the pub public benchmark by a wide, wide margin. And so, you know, being average is not great, although average in most parts of the world over any time period for private equity is still going to outperform public. And that's why it, is, it tends to be the best performing asset class that most LPs have. And that's why they're so interested in putting more money in it, because for all its illiquidity, for all of the fees and all of the things that people pay for, at the end of the day, on a net basis, it still tends to outperform um, on most time horizons. And so the industry has kind of defied gravity for a long period of time. And people look now and say, well, multiples are up, the competition's high, we have all these macro headwinds we're talking about. Isn't the outlook for returns? Shouldn't it be lower? Um, and I think that there's an argument for that. The counter argument for that is something that in what Andrea said, which is that the industry is becoming much more technology based than it ever has been before. 31% yeah, of all deals last year uh, were in the tech sector. And 90% of the value of that, as Andrea noted, is in software. But I could actually argue that the impact of tech is much bigger because if you look inside of healthcare, I'd look at healthcare IT, which was way up last year. If you look inside of financial services, a lot of it is fintech and in payments and digital, and that, that is technology and software. Um, if you look at a lot of business services, they're tech enabled business services. So I could easily make an argument that half the deals in the market actually have a lot to do with software and technology. And that's important because what that means is growth. People are underwriting more growth in the buyout industry than ever before. So we're seeing far less of the buy it six times EBITDA fix it up value deal now than we did 15 years ago. And when you underwrite more growth, you're expecting revenue to double, triple, quadruple over time. You're going to pay a higher multiple for that. You have to pay more if you're really expecting that kind of EBITDA growth and revenue growth in the future. And if you're right, then you're going to generate a huge return, even paying a, a, a good number for it. If you're wrong, then you're going to generate a lower return. And I think at this stage, it's too early to say 
whether we're right or wrong, but I think it's interesting to note, and we do a lot of thinking about it at Bain, that the industry is underwriting a lot more revenue growth than it ever has in its history. And so how well they're doing that underwriting and how well they're actually going to be able to use value creation levers to partner with management to get that is ultimately going to determine to a large extent what the returns are going to be in the next five years. Andrea, Cambridge Associates historically uses uh, long-term return assumptions for each asset class in, in your asset allocation models. Those very rarely change because you think about those over you know, 15, 20, maybe even more years. You know, it, it, does that, um, does, does, does that anchor people in the right way? Or is it kind of like the whisper number where, yeah, that's our long-term assumption, but because we've been running so much higher than that, people are still really kind of expecting you to beat that. It, it, you know, uh, great question, Deb. And the, the long-term return assumptions we use in our asset allocation models are simply are used to basically plan out how exactly the contour of a, of a, of a program is actually gonna play out from a commitment pace, redistribution pace, as I talked about, and then how do you maintain the allocation that you are seeking for your program, right? So those long-term return assumptions are really used for very careful scenario planning as you're, as, you know, as you're familiar with. We did a deep dive and revisited them. We probably brought them in 100, 200 basis points, perhaps a couple of years ago, actually. But, okay. but honestly, you know, we, the long-term return assumptions of the asset class, given the continued supply of capital, have to go down, right? But the point I would make for everyone, and I, I'm sure Bruce has lived this himself, right, which is this area is not monolithic, right? The dispersion of return around different managers applying themselves in different ways in different corners of the market at different times is going to result in a significant <laughs> dispersion of return around a median. And while that median currently is elevated due to the robust you know, tail end of the, of the bull market that we've been in, it normally runs around for private equity, if I might, the typical median return typically runs around, let's say 12% net, right? And right now that median is, is actually in the 20s. It's going to come down, right? Long-term investors know that and they haven't, they haven't been like, oh, well, I'm just going to assume I'll always earn a 25% return. <laughs> and then as you know, the dispersion of return is significant. Um, where we believe actual, let's call it old school private equity returns can still be found, will be in the lower middle market end of this market. The mega funds, due to the analysis we've been doing, as they continue to grow and acquire larger and larger businesses, law of large numbers being what it is, whatever operating capability you have, good luck trying to move the needle on a 40 billion enterprise value company. What we've noticed is that the mega funds are more closely correlated with public market returns then their lower middle market brethren. So what I think we're going to see, and, and this may, may be more of a tail end of our conversation, is we've, we've been calling the market is bifurcating into two, two parts. The mega fund, the deep end of the pool, which is more correlated with the pub public markets, where you basically have private, you have exposure to the stay private for longer. And then if you want actual, let's argue, the expression of actual private equity returns, you're going to have to stay in the, in the shallower, lower middle market end of the pool. And we see that also in the venture space as well. Venture capital returns are best expressed in venture capital size funds. So. Bruce, I'm sure you're really happy to hear that given that you're out fundraising for your uh, I'd like to bring Andrew in my fundraising uh, meetings. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so when you and I were speaking, Bruce, you know, I had asked you the question whether you'd had to change any of your return assumptions and you basically said, no, you're underwriting to the same returns. So what has changed? What have you had to do differently to be able to continue to uh, underwrite to the same level of returns over, over the last well, that, decade? Yeah, the answer also depends upon what time frame you're thinking about. You know, when we started in 1986, our IRRs, uh, were, it was only about IRRs back then. And, and, and if it wasn't 50% IRRs, you know, you, 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 weren't, you weren't doing anything. You know, you fast forward to today, uh, and again, we look. We 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 are in the in the lower middle market, and and our transaction sizes are generally four hundred million dollars and less. And kind of our sweet spot is more than fifty to two hundred million dollar en uh, enterprise value uh, entry level. So, um, you know, in that in that world, we think we can still achieve you know two and a half times our money, you know, mid twenties gross IRRs. But it all but what it also means is to find those opportunities. Um, you know, you're also we're not doing the velocity that, that we used to do in the old days. You know, we would do four or five new investments a year, and and we have to be satisfied with two new portfolio opportunities a year now because it's, it, you know, the the 
the universe is, um, you know, it, we have a lot of competition and, and, and when you're playing in the, you know, the five to $10 million EBITDA business or the, or the less than $20 million EBITDA business world, you know, the old days, it, you could, a lot of those companies couldn't get well banked. They didn't have investment banks that would be interested in, in providing the services to get, get out to the market in a very efficient manner. But today there's so many boutiques that, that even a $5 million EBITDA business gets great, can get, can get great service. So, you know, the, the model in, 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 you know, to achieve the returns is kind of what Andrea said, you got to add value, you got to, you got to be able to find, you know, buy a business that you could buy right. And we're generally looking to double or triple the revenues of, of our company. So they're, they're hard to find, um, but we are, you know, we are, are kind of are going in multiples because we're playing in a smaller field and bringing, bringing um, resources that these companies don't have on their own. You know, we're going in, in, in our consumer deals at about seven and a half times upfront entry level and in the healthcare kind of about eight and a half times. So, you know, historically high, but relatively good. Um, but it's, but, but you know, we have other, we have other risks to deal with in, in, in multiples when the businesses are small. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and pick up on some of the themes that, that some of you have already sort of mentioned. And so let's talk about the role that private equity plays in, in institutional portfolios. And, um, you know, Andrea, you made the comment that you think uh, portfolios maybe can withstand more illiquidity than we think, which I thought was a pretty interesting and provocative statement. Um, you know, obviously, with private equity's performance being so strong over the last several years, uh, allocations within people's portfolios have grown. Are, are LPs over allocated to private equity today? Is there still room to allocate? Um, just and certainly given the pace of new fundraising that's kind of coming back to market, what does that what does that really mean? And then I'll throw a sort of another curveball question in there, which is you know given the heavy uh, technology bent that we've all talked about that's happening in private equity, is PE really diversifying in a portfolio anymore? You've got the public markets indices that are very heavily tech dominated, and now you've got the private markets that are heavily tech dominated. So, so what does that mean for the role that private equity plays in portfolios? And maybe I'll start with you, Andrea, and then, you know, if you and Bruce, please feel free to jump in. So 25 part question, Deb, is that what I just wrote <laughs> down? <laughs> I'll take- You can handle it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just making sure I, I can hit these. So I'm gonna take the last question first in terms of how, is it too much tech and is PE really a diversifying investment anymore? Um, there's several answers to that. First, first answer, I'll be a little provocative, right? So Hugh mentioned 31% of all transactions are tech focused. We've observed that almost a third of, of invested capital, of the net asset value of private equity, not venture, private equity and growth equity is, is, is in the tech sector and tech has gone horizontal. Where do you think tech is going? Do we think tech is going to be even more than 30% of the industry five years from now? Is anyone who's actually, anyone who's under the 30, let's call it the 30% line, you're probably thinking I need to get myself to the 30% line. But guess what? If you get yourself to the 30% line in five years, you're still gonna be chasing whatever industry sector exposure is because tech is continuing to eat the world, right? So I think the more provocative marker down on the table is maybe you should be overexposed to technology given it's creeping into all corners of industry. And, and in order to capture the benefits of that growth and that massive secular trend, maybe you should be a little ahead of the rest of the pack. That's an interesting question. If you think about in this current market environment, heck yes, institutional investors are over allocated due to the growth and valuations, having them bump up against their allocation. They're up against their allocation because every manager that's coming back in this market, I've been describing it as the Hydra fundraising and market environment. So whatever manager you committed to as a fund three years ago came back and is now launching a continuation vehicle, an opportunities fund, maybe a crypto fund. That's a thing now, right? A crypto fund and also perhaps an early stage seed fund. So every manager that you were working hard to build a strong relationship with a few years ago is now coming back to their LPs and saying, I know you love me, love more of me. And that's also creating a challenge for institutional investors currently as well. So what we're watching anecdotally across the clients that we advise and invest on, on behalf of is that a lot of them are already done for the year. 
And so that should, in addition to the geopolitical concerns, the public market wobbles, rates rising, everything hopefully may take a pause. Um, I, I do think the one respite is that the public market wobble causing valuations to decline, which will glide through private portfolios over the coming quarters, should give everyone a little more wiggle room. Um, and, and I think the real challenge in this environment, Deb, is institutional investors should always be refreshing their selections, right? Because the firm of the future isn't going to come from the establishment. It's literally called the establishment for a reason, right? So the firm <laughs> of the future is usually a spin out, is usually trying to do something better than established practices. We're watching as long established firms evolve themselves. Absolutely, don't get me wrong. But where we are seeing more interesting innovation and focus in, and um, capability is often coming from new fund formation. And if you're over allocated in this market, you can't make a commitment to a new fund. So lots of challenges in this environment. Um, but I, I think on the tech side specifically, I actually think being a little over allocated right now might actually do portfolios a favor, just saying. Yeah, I mean, I would argue that, you know, there needs to be, <clears throat> LPs are over allocated if you look at what they say they want to be allocated at for all things private equity and all things illiquid. I think there needs to be a complete rethink of the allocations of portfolios for LPs in general, uh, because I don't fundamentally believe economically they're over allocated at all. I think the secular trend of growth of private markets and alternatives in general is going to continue, as I said at the outset. And you know, to your point, Deb, earlier, where are you going to put the money? Um, the public companies in the U.S. are down from double-digit thousands to four thousands, and of the four thousand five hundred, six hundred of those are SPACs, and who knows what the heck those are? A bunch of them are going to blow up. So that is a shrinking, high-tech, high-capital, um, high-cap uh, market that's not really representative of the entire economy anymore. And in most other markets, they, with the same thing, the stock markets are more thinly traded, they're large companies concentrated in a few sectors, you don't get real access. So how much of that do you need as an LP is one question to ask. The credit markets have been horrible for a decade and that they're not really attractive. Maybe they get more attractive with interest rates going up in the future, but private credit is growing at much, much faster than, uh, than the banks are. And so that's a burgeoning private equity, quote unquote, asset class, even though it's credit. So I think you need to look at this product proliferation that Andrea was thinking is talking about and saying there are crypto funds now and there are long hold funds and there are sector specific funds and there are all different kinds of products. And this growth equity thing is coming out of my buyout allocation in a lot of cases because I didn't have a growth equity sleep for as, as an LP two or three years ago. So I'm pushing lots of chips onto the table into private uh, investments, but maybe they should be there because my alternatives actually don't look as good as they did 15 years ago. And I don't really feel like those are there. So I think it's an interesting question to ask and LPs are asking themselves, what does my portfolio look like? And as Andrea said earlier, can I stand a little bit more illiquidity and do I, do I raise that sort of amount that I'm willing to put into illiquid assets even higher for the long term, uh, thinking that, that these are going to be more interesting, actively managed places to go and have an opportunity to generate more alpha and not just beta because of the proliferation of those markets and the sophistication of the investors that are creating a lot of these new products. Yeah, the, the, the other factor I think that's out there as well is a lot of the funds that have had that technology exposure have seen their NAV go up 20 to 40 percent. Um, and if they're not increasing their allocations, they're, they're, then they don't have enough capital uh, to, to do new funds. So if you don't increase, you, you, you really don't have enough for the existing investors because uh, given the, the level of re-ups right now. Yeah, yeah. The, the illiquidity question is an interesting one, given where the precipice that we're all standing on, um, and our our private investment allocation model is the is the number one model used in our practice. So like it, it's constantly being rerun for scenario planning. But the the question of if you are and many of our clients are fifty percent have fifty percent exposure to privates broadly writ right is you mm -hmm. know Hugh mentioned the the cornucopia of different options today. Many of our clients are acknowledging that is where returns can be found. If I can be more, just one more day illiquid than the next investor, I can access that return. And so there is a lot of, of modeling. There are a lot of revisiting of how much cash do I need on hand to meet my commitments? And maybe the, making the assumption, Deb, that if all my managers called all their capital, I need all that in cash. 
maybe not the right approach to thinking about like illiquidity <laughs> and liquidity. Um, so there, there are lots of, there's lots of rethinking, but it's all in search of return. And if you really don't need the liquidity for other uses in your program, you can go a little more liquid and maybe access more of these private markets. So one of, one of the things that I've always liked to say is that volatility isn't what kills you. It's not being liquid enough uh, when that volatility comes along to actually like live through to fight the fight. The fight. And so I guess the question becomes, you know, can, can portfolios withstand that, that increased illiquidity, particularly when I take a look at a lot of my peers in the endowment and foundation space that have zero allocations to like cash and fixed income securities or very, very small allocations. Does that mean you need to rethink um, kind of what role cash actually plays in a portfolio? How else do you kind of withstand those spikes in illiquidity to kind of live to be able to take advantage of those opportunities? Yeah, I, I think the, the question of making sure you understand what your actual liquidity needs might be, and then you've got a, then you've got a, you do have to layer on capital call assumptions, right? And recalling the GFC, no one was calling capital for, I would say, a fairly decent 12, 12-ish 12 months. And so the, the classic scenario we're often asked about in this environment, and we run many different kinds of scenarios at CA, is the really tough one is the markets drop, so all valuations drop, and the GPs all call capital. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen in the GFC probably not going to happen because if we don't if we can't navigate the market we don't know there's no price discovery it's really hard to make a move and good companies don't sell themselves in downturns right so i think that's a that's a very aggressive downside scenario case um and it's it's something that we talk about a lot internally and with our clients about what is realistic and then what is your funding source if you actually are maintaining a very low actual cash balance? And so if you are funding from public equities and public equities are down, we need to talk about that, right? And are there alternative sources of funding in your program if you really want to run it as zero cash uh, allocation? Does that, does, does, that, does that calculus change a little bit in terms of GPs not calling capital because the bid ask spread, ask spread blows out in a downturn? given the fact that so many GPs are now using subscription lines of credit, because what we saw when, when COVID hit in, in March of 2020 was that all of the uh, GPs that had banked all of this capital on their line of credit wanted to pay down their subscription lines so they had some dry powder to be able to support their portfolio company. So we were actually getting a tremendous number of capital calls, and I know that that put the squeeze on a number of LPs. The capital call facility, uh, you know, the, the unbelievable uh, tactical use of commitment facilities is likely to continue, but it, it does result, it, the, what happens in a downturn is absolutely going to rely on the capabilities and the capabilities of the GPs in that market environment. And if they're, if it's really difficult to have price discovery and your, your scenario, Deb, of GPs drawing down capital from their, paying down their commitment facility so they have the dry powder, that is a very likely scenario when whatever's coming uh, coming and furling in front of us. And so it is something LPs probably should think about. As you know, and as we do, constantly surveying GPs in terms of what do you believe, you know, what do you have in motion in your pipeline this quarter? What do you think is gonna close? Based on everything we're watching in the macroeconomic environment, how are you preparing the portfolio? Give us an update, right? So this is where, the LPs who are already exhausted from the fundraising environment are now having to really dig in up to their elbows in terms of maintaining more closely monitoring the managers where they already have capital invested. Yeah, I generally say that people talk a lot more about capital squeezes at the LP level during uh, times when the market is very frothy than when it's uh, than when it's gone negative. So the last few years that you mentioned earlier, when when you're expecting a GP to come back every four years and they're coming back every two years and raising a 50% larger fund, that causes a lot of LPs heartburn uh, because they, they're not, their cash planning doesn't account for that. But as we saw in the GFC and as we saw really at COVID, everybody was worried that there are going to be these massive capital calls by GPs and the LPs are going to be underwater. And that just didn't happen because if I'm a GP and I've got a problem with a company, I'm going to call the creditor. I'm going to call the bank. I'm not going to call my LP and irritate them because I want to raise more money from them in the future. I'm going to cut a deal with the bank if I really have to, to figure out a way out of this. And I think one thing that 
GPs learned very well coming out of the Great Recession is if you can just find a way to hang on to a business, you will recover and be able to, generally speaking, get a return from a decent company. So don't let the capital structure allow you to lose control of the business over time. Don't go calling the LPs for huge capital calls because then they won't want to re-up with you in, in the future if you're continuing to put the pressure on them. And, uh, and I think the industry is kind of, generally speaking, got that motion down, that what we want to do is cut all the costs, flood the balance sheet with as much cash as I possibly can without doing all of those things, cut a deal with my creditors if I have to, in order to continue to hold on to the business so through, through bumpy times. But I want to be going back to my LPs and giving them good news as to why I'm putting pressure on their, on their cash allocations. I'm, it's good news is we're doing great in this fund and I'm back in two years instead of four. This is wonderful. So write me a bigger check and we'll, we'll all be happy together. Bruce, I did want to come back to something that uh, both Hugh and Andrea mentioned, which was this growth in growth, growth equity, growth capital, and the concept that this could be crowding out um, allocations to buy out in the portfolio. And we're seeing that within our own portfolio at Colby, um, where um, all of the proliferation of funds and you know, the hedge funds that are doing crossover late stage rounds and the venture funds that are raising larger growth funds there's all this growth capital out there that we're, we're now committing to. Are you finding when you talk to your longstanding LPs that that's become an issue? What are you hearing from, from investors? Yeah, we, we haven't, you know, I guess maybe in the, in the low middle market, we haven't really seen that being, you know, the an alternative, a big alternative for, for our LPs. And I think we're, where we're seeing their, you know, their concerns about availability is what you said is there, you know the, 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 the you know the re-upping in two years versus four years with all the re-LPs. You know, I think I think we had talked to one LP this week. You know they had forty-five re-ups. Average is usually twenty, um, and so it, it's just it's just a, you know, the, the abundance of existing funds um, coming back. I, I haven't seen the only thing I've heard from LPs is really you know what, do they do more or less tech? And I think a lot of them are concerned about not being able to repeat the returns in tech and and thinking that they should they should. Uh, Diversify a bit away from where they've been, but you know that's again. I've, I've got. A, I, I don't have as big a universe that I, I talked to as Andrea and, and you. Yeah. yeah, I think the interesting thing about growth equity is that it is a. It, it's not really. It's it's being defined as an asset class, but it's not really an asset class. It's a style of investing. It's a style of investing that's been around for a very long time, and there are just so many players in it uh, now. And you mentioned some of the hedge funds that are crossing over. There are institutions, Fidelity Investments invests in growth equity. Uh, there are venture capital funds that are moving into growth equity. I, I tend to define in a cartoon kind of way, growth equity is the space between venture capital where you're asking, is it a business to buy out where I know it's a business. I know I can put leverage on it. People will lend credit against it. And there are things I can optimize and levers that I can define on the revenue and cost side to actually make more value. This is a space in between those two spaces where you can stay private longer and owners and founders of businesses who want to control them for longer don't have to give up control to the public markets and they want to stay private. And there's a tremendous amount of capital that wants to get in that space. And because tech is eating the world, as you said, Deb, there are more of these businesses in existence than ever before. And that's what's driving the tsunami of money into these. And they tend to be tech oriented. Uh, a lot of them are fintech oriented. We work with a lot of these investors. And if you look at a space like financial services, which is 20% of global GDP, banks and insurance companies in the FS market is still a 19th and 20th century kind of industry in the way they're run. If anybody's wired money overseas lately and wondered why it takes four days to get there, this is part of the problem. Or if you buy crypto from Coinbase and you can trade 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ you can only do it Monday to Friday for a few hours. You know what I'm talking about. This is all going to be remade over time. And growth equity is in large part fueling that with all of these disruptive businesses that are now in play. And people are seeing this is much lower cost, much more efficient, much more customer friendly in just that sector. And it's happening in a whole wide range of sectors. So these opportunities people see make sense. They're funding them but they're funding them in very different ways. If I am a buyout fund, um, like a TPG or a Blackstone, and I have a growth equity arm, I'm doing underwriting that feels comfortable to me that's much more like a buyout uh, would be. And I'm being very cautious and underwriting a company for a very specific reason. 
if I am more of used to placing lots of bets and lots of markets and more of a momentum investor, I may be spending a few days looking at things. And I'm placing lots of bets in the sector, hoping that someone will be 100 times my money and that'll make it all pay out. Those are really different approaches to the market. Or if I'm a Fidelity Investments, I might be doing this defensively because I'm worried that my business model may be out of date in a few years. So I'm, again, taking a slightly different approach. So the levels of risk that people are willing to take, the amount of underwriting and diligence they're actually doing is very, very different. And there are some bubbly aspects to this growth equity market that are absolutely, in my view, going to going to blow up over, over time. Like We're going to have some negative outcomes as a result of this, and we're going to have some very positive outcomes as a result of it. And I don't know what the net of it is going to look like. It's been very positive to date, but it is going to be a huge factor in private portfolios going forward, how well those actually do, what GPs, LPs are investing with and why, and do they really understand the risk return trade-off they're making and the style of investing they're investing in, in this thing we're calling growth equity. I mean, it, it's interesting to hear you reflect those things. I, I would beg to differ, actually. We identified and scoped out growth equity, gosh, 14 years ago. And the strategy of growth equity, classic growth equity, right? I think what we're conflating is, gro- is companies that are growing rapidly with the actual investment approach of growth equity. Growth equity classically is a company was bootstrapped by its founders, is clearly adding value to the clients it's earning because it's been bootstrapped by its founders and can't afford to burn through its cash. That strategy catches on, they start to scale and they actually don't need the money because they're actually reinvesting all of their profits in the growth of their own business. And so the classic growth equity houses, and we can name them, there's like four or five, they're the ones that have the armies of outbound analysts trying to identify these companies who didn't need the money and convincing them to take the money, right? And so the way we've been analyzed growth equity, and we've done the, we've done the work on parsing between venture growth equity and buyouts, is that growth equity by the very nature that these companies of many sizes, by the way, even firms like Blackstone Growth have actually been the very first institutional investor in a very large scale growth equity company, right? Is that typically these businesses have already achieved market, um, they've escaped velocity from market tech, They have paying clients and they just need to scale their business and they might take in that equity capital to help them scale their business a bit more. And so because they've achieved market velocity, the risk of failure has been deeply mitigated. And typically there's no leverage on these companies, right? I I forget in our paper, we laid out, you know, the six things that we believe defines growth equity as a space. And I'll tell you what doesn't define growth equity, massive stacks of VC beneath your growth equity investment that actually creates a lot of challenges as we've observed. So the way we've seen growth equity play out is the loss ratio of growth equity is more akin to that of private equity of buyouts. And the upside scenario of growth equity glides underneath venture, of course it does. Um, And so you have a little bit of more of you, you're, you're gliding a little bit towards the growth of venture with about the same loss rate as buyouts. And these are in spaces that are growing in companies growing faster than their peer set in sectors growing faster than the overall economy. So Bruce, to your point, growth equity is typically technology oriented. You got some life science-y healthcare stuff in there. And there is consumer. I've actually said there's a pretty healthy chunk of growth equity focused, consumer focused investors. And so we have seen it be very clearly defined and outlined, and it does play a role. There's very little leverage used in growth equity, right? And so in that sense, given what's unfurling in front of us, having a little more growth equity in companies that are growing their revenues, but with more mitigated risk factors, it's a pretty attractive space. And and actually, Deb, we have seen many of our clients add a healthy dose of it to their programs. And I hate to say it, it kind of does eat into the buyout. And for those of our clients who are a little more gun shy on venture, it eats into the venture. Sits in the middle, just just like you said. You're on mute, Deb. Deb, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, Maybe we can switch a little bit now to talk a little bit about exits, which we talked about a little bit earlier in the conversation, but maybe we can uh, dive in a little bit more on that topic. Um, You know, clearly there are more assets that are being held privately for longer. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that we've seen, and I think, um, Hugh, the, the Bain um, annual report showed this was obviously the exits to SPACs and the sponsor to sponsor exits have all grown. Exits have grown 
material across the board, as you as you rightfully pointed out. But you know, my, my question is with the growth in sort of the sponsor to sponsor exits, is that is that healthy? Is that not a healthy market? What does that what does that mean? And maybe I start with you, Bruce, to say, you know, with the companies at the state, you know, you're usually the first institutional capital into a company. Are you seeing a lot more exit options? today than you did five or 10 years ago. What's, what is the implication for you? And then maybe open it up to, to Andrea and Hugh. Yeah, look, we, we, we generally try to create a business that would be more attractive to strategists because they traditionally been the higher bidders. That hasn't really been the case the last three or four years. Um, so, you know, I think we've seen, a, you know, a lot of our exits have been to other private equity firms. It's a you know, bit of a surprise to us as we've gone through the, the processes. Um, but, you know, especially, you know, kind of in, in areas where it's platform oriented and there's, there's value add, you know, for acquisition strategies, um, you know, that's been a, that's really been a, a, a buyout orientation oriented uh, universe, but, um, you know, I think. And like, are I those think, sponsors paying more than the strategics are bidding? Yeah, yeah. Because you know, what's happened is the strategics are really, are other, other sponsor, sponsor oriented platforms and they're trying to, they're trying to average down after their, you know, their second after, you know, in their second, third, and fourth, uh, you know, and twenty-first acquisition of, for their platform, and so um, you, you know, when you have a, something of scale um, that could be a new platform, it, it's it's always a you know, and you, you can't. It's hard to get strategics. I'm thinking more in, in, in and that's a lot of the healthcare stuff we do. You know, in the consumer world, you know, it's it, it's both. It, it could be it, it could be strategic. It could be you know, it's a little bit different world. But but again, there's 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 so many. Um, um, there's so many private equity firms out there that we're, we're finding that that especially the last couple of years, the strategics have kind of fallen off as being aggressive. Um, and, and it's the private equity firms that, that really are, are, are more aggressive and, and are, are actually using time to their advantage as well, that they can, they can close faster and they can commit sooner. And, you know, a lot of the larger funds that, that, not, you know, that we sell to, because I mean, generally we're trying to Double or triple or even die, so that it's getting it's going to a different buyer universe, um, and and you know they're using their you know even private equity firms now are using their you know using their balance sheet to say we can we can close without financing outs, you know they're 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 reducing the diligence timeframes and and that's hard for the strategists kind of to match that time frame. And I'd also add to that that you know the, the sponsor to sponsor channel in Europe has always been vastly more prevalent than in the U.S. So the U.S. is kind of catching up, and the returns there have always been strong. Um, the, the so I, I don't think there's any negative impact on returns. I'd also say the nature of the U.S. market is changing, so it is going to be more sponsor to sponsor in the future because more than half of all deals now are add-ons, and this buy and build strategy is really taking off across many many industry sectors. If you look at what's happened in retail healthcare. Everything from the initial dental ones to veterinary care to dermatology to physical therapy—I mean, you name it—it's gone all across. There are no natural strategic owners for these businesses, so we're building lots of private equity platforms and lots of larger companies where the strategic buyer that you ideally see at the table doesn't exist, or as Bruce said, it's another private equity buildup that uh, that you're going to be selling to. And so, I do think that we are seeing a lot of different types of businesses now particularly through the buy and build strategy or just add-ons, the way that they put together, where you look and say, well, what is the natural strategic buyer for that? And sometimes you wind up with not, not very many. And the best buyer is going to be a private equity owner who's ready to take that company or that platform on the next stage of its journey and is willing to pay up to do it. And they still see enough runway to actually make, uh, make that investment pay off over time because different skills or different things may be needed uh, for that next phase of the journey. Yeah, we did the math on this. Uh I want to say 10 years ago, because it's a classic question, right? We all watch the sponsor to sponsor dollars and materiality in Europe. And it stands to reason as more and more private, privately owned companies trade to private equity in the US, they're going to come right back out five, seven years later, back into the market. And who's got the money to buy it? Private equity. So it just stands to reason more and more of the private economy in the US is going to go towards institutional private equity. And we did some analysis on this following the path of, of sponsor to sponsor. And against the backdrop of just overall private equity returns, what we did find, we actually had two conclusions, right? Um, let's say the David to Goliath trade, the I'm in a small fund, I've run out of runway, this is a great company, I can't hang on to it. And by the way, the current asterisk on that is the continuation fund, if I might. 
but mm-hmm. fine. If you have to sell it on, typically a private equity buyer can come in, a Goliath fund comes in, buys it, recapitalizes it and keeps going on that add on acquisition trail that Hugh described. Those deals tend to work out quite, quite well. However, two, two interesting other observations came out of the work that we did uh, combining our, our databases all together. One was the Goliath to Goliath trade, not so much. More just friction cost, LP, to, you're like, I own this in three books. The, the Goliath cost of a larger company just being sold to another large fund, what are you gonna do with that law of large numbers being what it is? You either have to take on more risk or you just do no harm and you basically have the same return. The other thing, which I'm a little more worried about in this environment, if I might, the the sponsor to sponsor to sponsor to sponsor trade. <laughs> those, um, our initial analysis showed that the returns of those tend to degrade over time. So once you've, once you've consolidated and you're a super regional or you're already a national player, how much more can you really take this if the multiple environment is not favorable? I don't think the multiple environment is going to be favorable going forward. So I'd say for all the institutional investors out there, keep an eye on on those two elements of sponsor to sponsor, because we have seen information sharing, you know, our own information indicates, you know, blinking orange light on those. So. So I wanted to, we've got only got a couple minutes left here. And so with that, with that remaining time, I wanted to ask each of you for sort of a big, bold prediction over the next decade in, in private equity. Um, make, to, to ask you to make a, a, a bold prediction about something that you don't think people are th- paying enough attention to or any attention to that could very well happen um, you know, over, over, over the next decade. Who wants to start? I won't cold call you on this one. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll jump in. So to, I've already, I already hinted at it, right? There's a bifurcation already underway, a fracturing going on in the institutional private equity arena. And the larger end of the market is going the way of a public market proxy in the private space. The other hints at this, by the way, has anyone been watching the SEC proposals? Oh my God. There, there, <laughs> there's a path being cleared for retail investors to more directly access the private markets. And those retail investors require protections. And I'm going to offer put, uh, you know, the largest funds in the market that are continuing to scale up in size are the ones preparing themselves to be that option. And so I, I do think this bifurcation that we've been talking about at CA for a couple of years is going to continue. That's, that's one prediction for you, Deb. Excellent, I love it. I would, say, I would say part and parcel of that, I think, as, as we get through the next four or five years. Uh, Andrew, what do you think the number of private equity funds are, exist in North America? 5,000, 5, 6,000? So I, 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 would, I would predict it goes down to a well north south of 4,000 um, um, because I think the, the, the dearth of transactions over the next three or four years will not allow for the money to be spent. I think the continuation funds are going to take, take volume Away from a lot of that's you know the the sponsor to sponsor deals, uh, and those and those are are continuing to be um, attractive to the GP and the LP community. Um, um, so I, I just think that there's not going to be enough transactions over the next three or four years to support the amount of capital that's been raised. And uh, the prediction I'll layer on top is that I do think that the secular trend uh, of more money going into private markets is going to continue uh, dramatically. And the one thing the private markets don't offer is liquidity. Uh, and so we are going to need a much different and a much larger set of secondary markets in order to provide liquidity for GPs and LPs. Uh, most people forget because they think that GPs are walls of money and they are, but it's not their money. It's the LPs money over time. And so to invest in things like digitizing my investment platform, getting into a new asset class, moving into a new geography, I need capital. And most folks that don't have a public balance sheet, which is 90 plus percent of the industry, don't really have a balance sheet to do any of that. So they need liquidity. LPs need liquidity. They're going to be moving around in ways that people haven't imagined before. And there are already dynamic new products being raised out there to provide liquidity for investors of all stripes. And I just think that market is going to absolutely explode. We're going to see a lot of creative energy put into how do I sort of get at making this more liquid, more tradable, because while the world can stand a little bit more illiquidity, not forever, and I might change my mind about what illiquidity I want over the two to three year period. So, Hugh, Hugh do you th- do you see a private equity firm selling their business in exchange for Bitcoin instead of cash? 
<laughs> we have seen a little bit of that, haven't we? <laughs> Not a trade I personally make. <laughs> Um, well, we, we could, I could ask you like 20 more questions here, but we are uh, at the end of our time here. And I just want to say thank you to each of you, Andrea, Bruce, Hugh, for, for taking the time. This has been a really great conversation. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, I particularly love your bold predictions. Um, uh, and so uh, can't thank you enough for, for spending the time with us. Um, just for folks who are listening in, um, thank you all for joining us for the first session of the day. The next session starts at 1030 Eastern uh, and it will be on venture capital and innovation. Um, and then please join us again at 1230 for the final session, a virtual fireside chat that you won't wanna miss. Um, and your existing Zoom link will get you to wherever you need to go. Again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Dean Grady. Uh, thank you to Brandeis for sponsoring this um, and hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Deb. Thanks, Deb.